Welcome everybody. Uh, tonight talking about things Civil War. Here we go. Uh, I want to provide one ca caveat. I am not a military sites archaeologist. Uh, it's not the sort of thing I normally do. Uh, and it's not my favorite subject. And you can ask me <clears throat> questions about sp different kinds of ammunition and uh, whatnot, and don't expect uh, uh, good, good replies. This is just not my area. That said, I have worked on a couple of sites, including Antietam, which is the subject for this evening. And we also identified and uh, explored a Union cavalry encampment uh, just above Port Tobacco in Charles County. Uh, I haven't made a subject of a talk because I mean, we found stuff that would just be a very brief talk. Um, anyway, this evening, I'm going to begin with a few words about, um, well, first of all, we have my definition of military archaeology, which is basically researching military life and understanding uh, specific battles. A military archaeologist may give you a different uh, definition, probably a, a wordier one. We're going to begin with Little Bighorn National Battlefield. I don't want to go into it in a great deal of depth, but I want to say a few words about it, show you some pictures, because the approach archaeologists take to battlefields today is very much an outgrowth of the kind of work that was done at Little Bighorn back in the 1980s. There was military battlefield uh, you know, archaeology before then and some interesting methods developed. But this effort um, really kind of captures how we do the work today. And interesting, you know, I put the date there, June 25th, 1876. This is a very interesting battle because it happened uh, about two weeks before the centennial celebration of our country. And so it wasn't really a good start to the commemoration because as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, Colonel Armstrong Custer's, uh, George Armstrong Custer's uh, unit was pretty much annihilated. And one of the interesting things about doing archeology span on a site like that is um, there was an investigation after the battle to figure out what had happened. And there were two basically different stories. There was the story of the United States Army, what they said happened. And that's the sort of thing you see in old films about Custer's Last Stand. You know, these, these men bravely, you know, uh, clustered around their, their, their commanding officer, you know, firing away, but clearly destined for death. And then there's the Native American perspective, which talked about these guys basically panicking and breaking formation, and basically a complete loss of military discipline. Two really opposing explanations of what had happened, or descriptions of what had happened. And again, this was on the year of the 100th birth of our country. Uh, needless to say, the Army explanation is the one that was accepted and remained accepted for a long time. But something uh, had happened uh, in 1983. This is a uh, it's not my image, I don't remember where I got it from, probably from the Park Service website, but this is the monument and the great, you can see the grave markers uh, for those soldiers who were uh, uh, interred by basically a, uh, an army cleanup uh, company that came in, they buried soldiers, buried the horses that had been killed and basically cleaned up the place. But in August, 1983, there was a brush fire and it burned a good part of uh, the monument area. And this really worried the National Park Service because there's no real depth to the deposits out there. Like a lot of Western sites, and you see this in the uh, Great Plains, you see it down the Southwest where a lot of the archeology span is really on the surface. And with a fire like this burning off the vegetation, lots of artifacts would be exposed. And the Park Service was really concerned about people coming through and basically pocketing stuff. So they mounted a major expedition that involved a lot of uh, uh, avocational metal detectorists. 
to collect and map the site. And I don't know who the guy is in the middle, but Doug Scott on the left, he's retired. I think he actually might live in this area now. And Melissa Connor, uh, they mounted this expedition and Doug eventually published a book on it, which is readily available through um, you know, online for a small amount of money. It's, really, it's a well-written book. And we're not going to go, I mean, they developed some interesting methods. But the basic one was they got these metal detectorists and systematically worked across the monument area, metal detecting, wherever they found a hit, they put a pin flag in the ground. Now, remember, we're out in the great, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere. It's not like there's a lot of trash out there from previous or subsequent occupations. Most of what they're going to find is going to be related to that military encounter. So they flag these things and then they will expose them and collect them. So they'll give a number to the object, they'll write that number on the pen flag, and then they'll come along and map it using, well, in this case, looks like an old style theodolite, we'd use a total station today, but basically creating a very accurate map of where they found stuff. And then from those distributions, they can reconstruct aspects of the battle. And it's not just, I mean, it's what they find. For instance, you could see a couple of yugs on the left, spent shells, casings, uh, spent casing over on the upper right, and then an actual um, lead projectile, lower right hand. So they find this stuff. But they're also mapping, for instance, the location. What direction is that bullet pointing in? Because whatever direction the bullet is pointing is, is got to be the direction from which it was fired. And out on this site that had not never been had not been plowed, had not been cultivated since the battle, the original orientation and location of all these artifacts or where they wound up in 1876. They're also looking at the spent uh, the casings because there are firing pin marks on those. And although they can't link a specific casing to a particular firearm, because they don't have that firearm, if they find the same markings on a whole bunch of casings, they could basically map the movement of that firearm across the landscape. And presumably it would be the same person using that firearm. And in some cases, you're finding a cluster of casings, well, that tells you somebody was at that location and fired off, in this case, at least seven rounds. And that means somebody who's holding their position. And of course, we find the, the, the spent projectiles uh, usually damaged. Um, the, where the casings are or where somebody stopped to fire off one or more rounds, where the lead projectiles are found, well, that's what that was the position that was being shot at. So we have both ends of the shooting incident. And we also find other aspects of you know, the encounter. We find horseshoes. This is, it, it was a cavalry unit, cal, cav, cavalry units. Um, but the approach at that time, typically, uh, cavalry wasn't what we see in the movies. You know, you know, charging with the bugle blowing and sabers flashing and all that. Typically what these guys would do is they would, they were mounted infantry and they would ride up to a position, dismount, and every fourth man would collect the horses of the other three and bring them back behind the lines while the other three would fire. Uh, but where we find obviously equestrian hardware like horseshoes, I mean, it clearly indicates where the horses were. And of course, these are army horses, not Indian horses, because they didn't shoe their horses. And we all, they also found the remains of horses. You know, there were quite a few horses killed. It was a stinking, smelly mess with flies and maggots and all that, as you might imagine. And so uh, there was an effort to at least cover things up with earth to kind of sanitize the place. So uh, there's, a, like a, there's several publications on this. Doug Scott's book is a really good one. And he pieces together exactly how they did this and how they came to the conclusion that they came to, which is that 
the Native American part of this, this uh, uh, description of what had happened is probably far more accurate than that of the army. Uh, the distribution of spent ordnance suggests that the uh, uh, army uh, unit had uh, broken and uh, men scattered. And when they did that, they made this, they, they, they were much more endangered. Mind you, they probably all would have been killed anyway, given the vastly superior Native American numbers. Okay, so I did that just sort of um, introduce you to uh, this bit of archaeology, which again, you can find uh, through eBay or Amazon. You can get a copy of the book and it's like 15 bucks maybe. But it sets up the methodology that we used at Antietam Battlefield. Oh God, it must have been about 10 years ago. I don't even remember when we did this. Antietam Battlefield, major battle, mostly on the 17th of September, 1862. There was actions on the 16th and on the 18th, but the bulk of the battle was on the 17th. And if you go out to Antietam Battlefield nowadays in September, you can see the uh, commemoration ceremonies they go through, lighting candles and whatnot. It was an incredibly bloody battle, but in some ways it was a turning point because the Union Army had suffered a number of defeats. Uh, the commanding general, McClellan, mostly because of political pressure, was uh, averse to moving his army uh, away from Washington, D.C. People were afraid the Confederates would attack uh, Washington. And so he wasn't keen on taking his troops out in the field. But they did meet General Lee's army at uh, Antietam. It was a pitched battle, very bloody. Uh, and I would say basically a draw, except for Lee had to retreat back across the Potomac uh, and lost his attempt at trying to essentially invade the North. So it was an important Union victory of sorts. And this is also the victory that Lincoln was looking for before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation a few months later. Uh, and it assured, it, it was Lincoln, Lincoln's way of assuring European powers to stay out of the fight, particularly the United Kingdom, to not support the Confederacy, that the Union would have this well in hand, and to support the Confederacy would be to back a loser. So this is only one very small study. There's been a lot of archaeology out at Antietam Battlefield. Most of what you're looking at in this picture and well beyond is part of the battlefield. Uh, if you haven't been out there, it's a beautiful place, rolling hills, mostly cultivated fields, huge cemetery for all the uh, dead soldiers. Uh, and it's just, just outside of um, uh, Sharpsburg. And it's just down the road from beautiful Shepherdstown, West Virginia, a place I highly recommend visiting. So our area of interest is really just down here, this sort of half moon here. That is the um, visitor center and parking area for the battlefield. And just near it is the Dunker Church, which is still there, built to, I think, 1852. Uh, the Dunkers were a, a German pietist sect, uh, religious sect. Um, I don't know what their relationship to Mennonites was, but it, probably somewhat similar. Uh, but this is, this is the area, and there are significant battles elsewhere. Just to the south was the Sunken Road, a famous locus of this battle, nearby the Cornfield and other uh, Burnside Bridge, all sorts of really important uh, bloody engagements. And there's lots of literature on this. You don't need me to cover it. In this map dates 1857 for Washington County. It's a beautiful map because it actually shows property lines. And I see Ray Kennedy is just rolling his eyes because we're trying to recreate property lines in the part of Anne Arundel County around Cirque uh, using surveyors' descriptions. And here it is, the surveyors just put it on a map so you can see it and attach the name to it and put the dwelling place for each of those names. So it's a wonderful map to have. Dates 1857, so this would have been available, it was a big wall map, would have been available uh, in, in 1862. Maps are really critical for uh, armies, particularly those who are maneuvering in areas that with which they're unfamiliar. 
uh, it's wonderful to have maps like this, uh, unless you're on the opposing side. So here's the area we're looking at. There's a whole bunch of maps that look sort of like this that have been recreated since the Civil War uh, by different military historians trying to reconstruct battles from uh, field communiques, from the reminiscences of uh, soldiers, and particularly officers. And so there are always a series of dashed lines in different colors. So the red dashed lines here represent uh, Confederate units. The purplish ones represent Union units. And this would have been you know, like 15 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes later, these lines would have been uh, moved. But it's a highly volatile situation. There's lots of attacks and counterattacks and you know, units winding up behind enemy lines. And it's just crazy. So the area that would be the visitor center is right here in this rectangle area. Again, Dunker Church is right across and the sunken road is just to the south. And I don't have, I guess I don't have the particular map. There's one map that actually shows right in our area here, it has a line that says uh, Stephen D. Lee or something like that. That's Colonel Stephen Lee, a distant relative of Robert E. Uh, he was a colonel in command of an artillery uh, battalion under General Longstreet, uh, Confederate side. And he was holding a position right in the area where we were doing some archaeology. He was fending off the 1st and 12th Corps of the federal troops. Uh, and by all accounts, his... his, his uh, 12 cannons or so did a pretty good job of fending off the Federals until they were forced to retreat back into Sharpsburg and then back into, you know, well into Virginia. I'm going to read this. Please don't try to read it yourself. Uh, too many words. Um, this is from um, immediately after the battlefield. It's a report of Colonel Lee. And it says, about 3 p.m., this is on the 17th of September, the batteries having refitted and replenished with ammunition, I again moved to the front with 12 guns, all that could be manned, presumably the others having been um, maimed by Union cannon fire, and received orders from one of General Longstreet's aides to take position in front of the village of Sharpsburg to the right and left of the turnpike, which is where we were working, relieving Colonel Walton of the Washington Artillery of New Orleans. Those in front of the village were exposed to a heavy fire of artillery and infantry, the sharpshooters of the enemy being within 200 yards of them during the entire evening. The guns of Moody's battery in connection with Squire's battery of the Washington Artillery of New Orleans repelled some six or eight attempts of the infantry of the enemy to take our position. At one time, their infantry was within 150 yards of our batteries when by a charge of our supporting infantry, they were driven back. The guns retained their position in front of the village till our troops were driven into the village on the right, when by direction of General Garnet, they withdrew. So in this, and I've left out some bits, but in this, we're basically, he's describing the action where apparently they moved back at some point and were relieved by uh, Colonel Walton's uh, Washington artillery. And then Lee moved back into position on both sides of the, the turnpike. And they were being fired at by sharpshooters, by Union sharpshooters. And they were also taking artillery fire. This back and forth movement is a bit of a problem in, in military archaeology because things get a little scrambled. So here's the area we're talking about. Uh, the Dunker Church isn't quite visible. It's a little bit off the map and a little bit off this photograph, but this large lunate shape, this was the area that we investigated archaeologically. This is the overflow parking. I mean, you could see a ribbon of pavement on the inside of that curve. That was the existing parking. The National Park Service wanted to pave this area. It had been used for overflow parking informally. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, one of the most common artifacts we found in this area were uh, the neckerchief slides from Boy Scouts, <laughs> they left a lot of debris uh, behind them. Uh, but this is an overflow area the Park Service wanted to actually put in a paved parking lot. And they did not and have not, uh, partly because of the archaeology we did. 
Um, they actually wanted to go ahead and pave it anyway, but the Maryland Historical Trust stepped in and said, now nah, this is important stuff. So anyway, inside of this lunate shape, uh, we did uh, shovel testing at 50 foot intervals, and we did metal detecting at 25 foot intervals. So that's what I'll talk about here. So here's the stuff we found. This is the stuff we found through shovel testing at 50 foot intervals, a total of 42 shovel test pits. We got bottle glass and liquor bottle glass and some coal and mason jar, a, a railroad spike, a machine cut nail, part of a drinking glass. None of this looks like military stuff. Although I will point out that the railroad spike could be military related because we know that the Confederates during the battle were running out of uh, ammunition. They had gunpowder, but they were running out of stuff to stick in their cannons. So they were using, among other things, railroad spikes from the near, nearby railroad. So it might have been uh, used as a weapon. So what we did, uh, why didn't that, why'd that flip? What we did was after we shovel tested and really found nothing related to the battle, we did metal detecting. And this is a, a the methodology was approved by both the National Park Service and the Maryland Historical Trust. And what we did was we put in a tape every 25 feet and we metal detected along that tape about a five foot swat, two and a half feet or so on either side. This is uh, the late Scott Lawrence, who worked with me on the project and with many others, um, real lost archaeology. And what we do is we'd, you know, we'd, we'd uh, move along the tape, and when we'd find something, we'd investigate, we'd pull up the saw, and trowel around a little bit and figure out what it was. We would bag it, we'd put a number on that bag, we'd put a number on a pin flag and mark that location, just like they did out at uh, Little Bighorn. So uh, these are the sorts of things we'd find. We'd find many balls. Now, uh, there are a lot of metal det det detectorists in this area, and they love looking for this stuff. But I got to tell you, yeah, there's some variation in what these projectiles look like. But basically, a bullet's a bullet. And, you know, you'll find folks who have box loads of these things that they've recovered. And I'm sure they're having a very good time. But what I hope you'll see this evening by the time I finish this is that this is really important evidence. And going about willy-nilly recovering you know, military souvenirs destroys um, the archeology span and it uh, potentially can affect our understanding of what has happened in the past. Yep. There we go. We also have a fragment, we, a number of fragments of fuses. And these things would be on artillery shells. This is part of the fuse uh, assembly. So when they fire these shells, they don't generally blow up on impact. The fuse causes that uh, shell to explode before it hits the ground because it's far more effective that way. It blows up and throws shrapnel in all kinds of directions and maims and kills lots of folks. So a piece like this tells us that, okay, this area is taking artillery fire. The bullet, you know, that tells us we've got small arms, we've got infantry firing on a particular position. Remember, it's the bullet, not the, the, the well, it wouldn't be casings in this case, they're probably paper cart cartridges, but still, this is an area that's being shot at, not a, we're not finding evidence of people shooting from here with small arms. So we've got fuses. We've got all sorts of, um, you know, small arms fire, uh, mostly stuff that's been deformed, uh, mini balls and, and round lead shot. Actually, the lead shot could be uh, shrapnel that was put in artillery canisters. Uh, and that's what you'd expect. We do find, occasionally we find bullets that clearly had not been fired, there's no damage to them. They're referred to as uh, dropped ammunition. In the heat of battle, you can imagine a soldier reaching for a cartridge, trying to put it into his 
firearm, dropping it, and ended up, you know, having to reach for another one. So when we're looking at this battlefield, <clears throat> again, it's a highly dynamic situation. You could draw all the lines you want, but these lines were constantly moving. And one of the best sources, if you're interested in the Battle of Antietam, one of the best sources you can look at is a book by a guy named John Priest. I have his uh, citation couple in a slide uh, towards the end. And he does, from the, in the different portions of the Battle of Antietam, he really does this minute, you know, not minute by minute, but quarter by, of an hour to an hour by hour uh, description of what's happening in, happening in each of those areas. Now, a limitation of Priest's work is that he's basing it largely on people's um, description of what happened soon after the fact and by reminiscences from years later. Obviously, the problem with people remembering years later is, you know, they forgot a lot of things. They got things wrong. Uh, and they're, their memory is influenced by later events. With descriptions right after the event, Every just almost every description you see of the Battle of Antietam was a place that's just covered between you know between some mist and the enormous amount of smoke from all that gunpowder being discharged. You know, very often these guys couldn't see anything. So there's some you know archaeology can really help. Now this table is represents the artifacts we recovered. A nice round gross of them do metal detecting. So when we pursue a, a, a metal fine, we'd also find the artifacts were metal. So there are other things in here, uh, like parts of a horse-drawn vehicle, vessel glass, even some stoneware, I think. But you can see in terms of ordnance, 26 pieces, uh, hardware, which could be from the wagons, the caissons and whatnot that were used. Equestrian, problem with equestrian stuff is that, yes, yeah, could be from uh, horses in the battle, but this area was also plowed, you know, went back into cultivation not long after the battle. So we don't know how much has been left behind by farmers and how much is actually military related. Again, we map stuff using total station, my old total station now, unfortunately, like uh, Scott, has departed us. Um, but I wonder who's taking this picture, actually. If he's running the instrument, then I got the rod. Uh, anyway, uh, we use that instrument to map the various finds, and then we plot those uh, using a digital drafting program. We plot those finds. Over here on the far right, you can see the visitor center. We mapped that in so we can relate what we found to a, a landmark. But you can see how I've got things. In this green, large green line here, that is the distribution of, um, here's my line here. Basically all, that's the site, if you will. The blue lines represent equestrian stuff, horse buckles and, uh, horseshoes. Oh, the green is artillery stuff. Fragments of artillery shells spread across the field. And the red ellipse down here represents small arms fire. Those are the mini balls, if you will, and the lead shot. <clears throat> so again, you can see, you know, those things you know, they, we map them, we give numbers, we, we, we need to figure out exactly where each of these things are found, even though the land has been cultivated. And from that, we can look at their distributions and hopefully figure out what was going on. So what I think we've got going on here is, the, again, the large green area um, represents artillery fragments. And that artillery might be field artillery nearby, but I would bet there's a good chance that those artillery shells, which there's certainly Union artillery shells, there's a good chance that they were being fired from about a mile to the east. If you go out to Antietam Battlefield and you come in on the road from uh, Boonesboro uh, heading west, you're up on some high ground and then you drop in elevation considerably as you come down onto 
Antietam battlefield proper, you'll, you'll pass a the headquarters of, of, oh, I don't recall who, maybe McClellan's headquarters, I guess, and a house, there's some park service operated uh, managed properties up there. But it was up on that high ground that Union artillery was organized and fired out on the battlefield. I suspect that that green line may represent that long distance stuff, or it could be field or, or, or artillery closer, uh, but still to the east. And that's being fired on probably Stephen Lee's position. The stuff in blue, the equestrian stuff is a little hard to interpret. You know, it could be almost anything, cavalry running through, could be the horses pulling caissons, whatever. And the red is really interesting because it's so localized in the south part of the site. And it's, it's projectiles, not shell casings, which for the most part we wouldn't have had at this period anyway. Uh, that tells me that that is where a battery may have been located. And artillery fire is kind of you know, approximated but small arms fire, especially if we're talking about Union sharpshooters 200 yards away, that actually perhaps more directly identifies uh, where there were uh, one or more artillery pieces set up and firing on Federals. So broader examples of the kinds of stuff we found, actually I think I photographed most of what we found. Um, so we found a huge amount of stuff because we were only sampling every 25 feet. So we got lots of fragments of horseshoes and horseshoe nails. Again, how much of this is military? How much of it was previous or subsequent farming? Uh, we, I couldn't tell. Perhaps if we did a more thorough study of the horseshoes and their styles, maybe we can date them better. I suspect not. Uh, the mini balls we've recovered. Um, there's all kinds of people who specialize in this sort of stuff and can tell you the caliber, just looking at these things and what kinds of uh, weapons in which they were used. But remember, in the chaos of the battle, and we have descriptions of this, we have firearms that are, are jamming, uh, that are misfiring. And it wasn't unusual for a soldier to grab the weapon of a wounded or dead soldier, regardless of which side that person was on, grab their weapon and use it. Also, you know, the Confederates had just recently attacked Harper's Ferry, where they took all sorts of military equipment. So I don't think you can easily distinguish what was used by Union soldiers as opposed to what was used by Confederate soldiers. Even if you could figure out that, you know, a weapon or, 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 or a, a bullet was Union, you don't know if it was a Union soldier who actually used it. Uh, again, we got lead shot. You know, I suspect a lot of this was canister shot uh, put into uh, art artillery shells. And again, when that fuse goes off, explodes the gunpowder in a shell, it explodes um, ideally just above ground, causing ma maximum havoc. Uh, just a table that shows the um, identifiable uh, projectiles that we managed to find. Most of them have been deformed, somehow flattened, but it gives the dimensions and the weight so we can you know, figure out what caliber these things are, if they haven't been too badly damaged. And even in one case, a specific kind of uh, uh, bullet, the Williams Cleaner three ring, which was used every third or fourth shot uh, because it was designed to clean out the detritus in the gun barrel. Because, you know, we're using gunpowder here. It leaves quite a residue. Those weapons need to be cleaned frequently or they'll begin to misfire and possibly even explode in the soldier's face. Uh, fragments of artillery shells as well as fuses. Uh, again, this, you know, this is from artillery shells fired at a particular position. And some of the descriptions we have there, including again, a specialist might be able to uh, say with a degree of authority, what kind of a shell it was, and therefore what kind of uh, artillery piece fired it. 
that would be useful because potentially because it could allow us to distinguish between uh, shells fired from a mile away up on the heights to the east or by smaller field pieces immediately to the east and north. Um, I don't want to bore you terribly about methodology, but uh, a couple of things bear pointing out. Uh, the work we did, I mean, that's it, is based on a small sample. We did not cover anywhere near 100% of that field. We did every 25 feet. And if you fear swinging that metal detector back and forth, we're covering about a five and a half foot swath. You know, we're probably only getting about a 5% sample of what's there. And so more intensive survey um, and by more practiced metal detectorists uh, would presumably yield a much larger sample and refine our story somewhat. Um, Sample size is really important in this kind of work because again, this isn't this isn't you know one bunch of guys lined up one place and opposite them another line of guys they shoot at each other for a while and then they both retreat, which is pretty much the case in another famous Civil War battle, Bronner Farm, where the Park Service has done some archaeology, where <clears throat> one of the field reports was there was no maneuvering and very little tactics again because you got one bunch of guys on one side one bunch of guys. On the other side, they shoot at one another, then they retreat. Well, that's going to leave a very clear, easy to read pattern. But nobody would describe Antietam battle as, as anything like that. It was chaotic. There's a lot of you know, movement back and backwards and forwards, um, people using the arms of uh, fallen soldiers, both their own and, and their enemy. Uh, it's a mess. And so a bigger sample would be very useful. Yeah. How big a sample? I don't know. Uh, and maybe military archaeologists have been working on this, but it would be very interesting to see just how big of a sample, how much metal detecting and mapping do you need to figure out with a high degree of confidence what's going on in a very complex battlefield situation. So again, our initial interpretations, um, we've got small arms and artillery, and that suggests that's not Stephen Lee's, I mean, it's his position, but it's not stuff left by him. It's stuff that was thrown at him uh, until uh, by orders, he retreated back into Sh uh, Sharpsburg. And if that's correct, well, you know, those, what we're finding could potentially be related to specific units of the Union Army. And I don't want to press that too far because I think there's a lot more archaeology that can be done there to clarify this. Um, but it does suggest we might get a finer detailed view of what was going on. And that is not biased by uh, the observers. So here's the book I mentioned, John Priest, Antietam, The Soldier's Battle, 1994. I think it's been reprinted a few times. It's a really nice book if you're interested in this kind of stuff. It really gives you a TikTok account of what happened over those three days, or probably more accurately, about 48 hours spread over three days. It's got lots and lots of maps, probably about six dozen of them, that for different positions, for different loci of that particular uh, of that battle, and the movement of individual units. Again. Uh, archaeology could potentially go a long way towards refining those accounts. So here is an example of the kinds of maps that Priest provides. So if you look towards the upper right hand quadrant where it says Tyndale, um, you can see the 3rd Maryland, the 28th Pennsylvania, the 111th Pennsylvania. They're basically moving across that area that, in which we were working because you can see the Dunker Church. Uh, just just uh, up and above. And you can see coming down straight north, the 78th and uh, 34th New York and 125th Pennsylvania. Uh, but then you've got, I guess it's Jubal Early's line there, Confederate, Barksdale, Anderson, these are all Confederate positions. So the, the book has a whole series of these maps that kind of show you in slow motion or like a series of snapshots of how the battle is progressing in different parts of the battlefield. 
Uh, the other thing, of course, we have to keep in mind again is that we've got units moving back and forth. You know, it may be uh, that Stephen Lee was pushed back uh, by Union troops and that Colonel Walton, you know, for the Confederacy pushed back. And so we're looking at a potentially a mishmash of uh, evidence here. But this is what we've got. And this is based on, I think, two days in the field, maybe three days, and it just Scott, Lawrence, and myself. Uh, the shovel testing yielded nothing of real value. It basically, shovel testing missed the battlefield. But metal detecting, even at 25 foot intervals over the course of two or three days, has raised the possibility that we could do some really interesting archaeology on a battlefield like this, even though it's been plowed, even though it's been picked over a little bit right at, right at the very end of the battle. There are souvenir hunters out there. But potentially, we can learn a lot about what happened that can refine what firsthand accounts provide uh, and maybe even challenge some of those firsthand accounts. So anyway, that's about all I have for this. I'm open to questions. Yeah, Jim, how much historical research did you have to do before you hit the field? And what was the purpose of it? How did I, it form your approach? Yeah, I, I, usually with projects, and this wasn't actually my project, but we were actually subcontracting uh, to strong environmental engineering firm who had the contract this. I don't usually do government work. Um, and the idea was the Park Service won essentially to pave this part of the battlefield mm -hmm. for parking. And so we were going in and determining whether or not there was historic, you know, historically significant material there, which I would have thought would be pretty obvious and there would be. But anyway, um, so I did some reading because I knew something about the Civil War, but not a lot, certainly not much about the Battle of Antietam. Uh, I went in relatively ignorant, and I, and I confess I remain relatively ignorant. Again, I'm not a military sites archaeologist. Um, and, you know, some of these descriptions of battles, my, glaze, my eyes just glaze over. Uh, it's just not something I've trained at. It's not something I actively work on. So I didn't go in with a lot of information, um, but the methodology we were using was fairly straightforward okay. and not all that different from, you know, it's sampling, it's field sampling. Yeah. Uh, so I basically just made the best of what we had. Would it have been better if a military site archeologist went in? Uh, probably, um, but on the other hand, the Park Service still, based on our findings, still wanted to pave this over. And the Maryland Historical Trust found the results sufficiently compelling to say no. So it is unpaved and there's still data to be had there. Any other questions? Come on, Dana, I know there's something burning a hole through your... Oh, I have all kinds of thoughts, given the many other sites I've worked on that are at least somewhat like this. But uh, I'm thinking, um, just pondering in the back of my mind what, the, what might be revealed uh, by the historic research just mentioned. Because um, many times you actually have information about what each unit was issued for their weaponry and um, they can only fire a certain type of bullet. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on what you found, um, you, could, you could possibly uh, identify specifically which units had the weapon that fi fired that projectile. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'm looking at your round balls and thinking, oh yeah, that does look like um, shrapnel rather than uh, musket ball, and it goes on. But you, uh, I, I can tell you that the archaeologists I know in the Park Service would typically say, no, don't pave it. Um, it's administration and people who want to design something that like to pave things over, not the historians and archaeologists typically. Yeah. So, 
I, I was a little surprised by their response. Uh, yeah. And, and I was really pleased to see the Maryland Historical Trust had my back on that. That yeah. has not always been the case. I agree with that. An, an awful lot of the Park Service um, administrative changes that I've heard about um, in the last 10, 15 plus years uh, points to a much uh, less interest in real research and protection of the resources than it does to present a public face and build things. And I, I was fighting that at the end of my career with them and it's gotten worse from what I've been told. See, what I would like to see in that particular piece of land, which is not very big, it's a couple, three acres, is let's do, hopefully with public participation, let's do 100% or close to it. Let's really, you know, cover that area well, recover what there is to recover as sort of an experiment, because it's one very small part of a very expansive oh, yeah. battlefield. And then build a damn parking lot. <laughs> That's that. doable. You know? Yeah, but I, I agree with your approach, given that you only did a, a, a small sample. Um, it's an area that is defined well enough that you could do a very thorough metal detecting survey with, uh, you know, five foot corridors completely um, covering that territory and even do a right angle swath that will capture the stuff that you missed on the first round, which is yeah. what I sometimes yeah. recommend. But it, it, it really shows that, you know, military sites archaeology is not just about finding a bunch of spent ordnance or some cases out of antique of human remains. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned, but it has to be because knowing what happened, even if we come up with a pretty supportable hypothesis of what happened at that specific location, it was a large, complex battlefield. How does that relate to the other parts of the battle? To really get a fuller story, we need to do the work. We need to do the study. And, and, and you're right. It, it really is tough. You've got, you've got a definable area there, but the battle and the, yeah, the battle took place over a much greater area. And then think about the, the direction of the fire and what's there to capture the um, the projectiles might be a half a mile or a mile away, and your your battle is in one place where the troops are, and the impact areas can be quite a lot farther away. But they'll still give you the direction of fire um, and information about the weapons that were available and used, and and more. So uh, it's a fire. huge long term project that people don't typically think about. The direction of fire is a little more difficult here than it would be, at, for instance, Little Bighorn, because that whole area had been cultivated, you know, right after the battle until the monument was established. So, well, um, a, a lot of it doesn't have to do with, say, the direction the bullet was fired in terms of um, how you find it in the ground, but impacted bullets, regardless of their angle as found in the ground, can still have only come from certain zones based on your historical information. Yeah. And uh, you can sometimes put together, let's say, the, the uh, impacted um, projectiles. Uh, yeah, but you can also find the place where they were fired from by the expended shells or the... Um, um, friction primers and things like that that would, would go with, say, the, the larger uh, artillery pieces and all. And yeah. uh, you put the story together and it might fit, it might contradict your historical information, but it fills it in in any case. Yeah. I mean, I could th even see going out there and basically finding the stuff, mapping it, but putting it right back where it found it. Yeah. I mean, since the site's been plowed, I mean, you know, what the hell? If you don't want to collect this stuff or if you think it might have some value for the future, you, you, you locate it with metal detectors, you unearth it, identify it, put it back in the ground and move on. And you've, you've basically preserved the archaeological record and still uh, exploited it somewhat. So. And, save, and save some storage space in the museum or wherever they'd be placed. Yeah, 
Well, the problem is conserving all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, even lead needs some conservation yeah. treatment. So, yeah, the, the, reason, the reason I asked that question was because I, I had done some work at a French and Indian War site uh, for a couple of summers. And after I was done doing that, I did some historical research that the guy I was working with hadn't done. And I was finding all kinds of things that raised more questions that I wanted to go back and dig, but the project was over and no more mm -hmm. permits were being issued. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's that contrast between research, you know, work that's purely research driven mm -hmm. and that which is contractually driven to, yeah. you know, in, in anticipation of some sort of construction project. And yeah, you know, they go with lowest bid, and yeah, you know, I wasn't the lowest bid. It was the company I was working for, yeah. or however they got the contract. So, you know, was I the ideal person to do that work? Probably not. On the other hand, maybe I approached it with a fresh pair of eyes uh, because I, you know, hadn't done much really at that point any military sites work. Yeah, but we use the same technique up at. Um, Port Tobacco on this Union uh, encampment, a small one that uh, local metal detectorist had found, recovered some really interesting stuff long before we got there. But he led us to that site. We went and did the same sort of approach. And we can actually see the parts of the encampment. We can pretty much see where the officers were camped, where enlisted men were camped, uh, and where the horses were kept. And that's not a battlefield situation. That's just you know, and, a cavalry, and that's more you know, that's more interesting because you can learn more about what life was like in the army at that point in time. Uh, even more interesting, interesting than the battle, yeah. If if that's your interest, yeah. But there's a lot of folks who are interested in the actual military engagements, yeah. and that's much more complex as archaeology goes. Gettysburg is the same way. I mean, it was fought mostly in open fields, and then you know, right after the battle, those farmers went back to plowing. Yeah. So these aren't these aren't pristine sites. Anyway, any other questions? Issues? Yeah, I've yes. got I've got a question. <laughs> can you can you tell us about the relationship between the um, the battlefield itself and the and the Maryland uh, Historic Trust? What was what was the power relationships going on there? It's part of a process in the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, as amended. Uh, basically, the State Historic Preservation Office, which is established through that act, has the right to uh, comment on federal actions that may affect uh, historically significant archaeological sites or standing structures, for that matter, you know, within the state. So the Maryland Historical Trust had the right to consult in this process. Actually, you as in, we as individuals do too. With Section 106, we can, as individuals, demand to be consulting parties. Most people don't know that. And so the state was automatically considered a consulting party with this federal action. And the federal, the National Park Service could have tried to you know, ignore the trust and go ahead with their plans. But then the conflict would be brought before the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, a federal institution, and they'd have to argue it out and uh, the Park Service would probably lose on that. And nobody wanted the fight. So they just, they just you know, said, okay, forget about our plans. And I imagine that area is still used as a informal overflow parking area anyway. So, you know, it's just not paved, that's all. But anything that involves the federal government in a particular state, that state is automatically a consulting party. Uh, it could be a high federal highway uh, being built or highway being built with federal funds, anything like that. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Next month, I'm talking about Bel Air Mansion, the home of a couple of uh, Maryland governors in Bowie, Maryland, uh, and some of the interesting kinds of things we saw, again, in a relatively small area. So I hope you will join us. Y'all have a good night.